Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Logos Project. This is your host, Dom. In this episode, Sam and I speak about eschatology. Enjoy. And all that jazz. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Logos Project. This is your co-host, Sam, here with my roommate, Dom. Today, I'm going to harass him and interrogate him about eschatology, which is, boom, you want to define eschatology for us? Your definition is going to be more eloquent than mine, I imagine. <laughs> eschatology. The study of the end. Yep, boom. Nothing better? The last thing. No, that was pretty good. Yeah. The la- oh, the last. See, that sounds smarter than the end. Or, or, or the study of the fulfillment of all things. Ooh, even better. Yeah. I would argue the more words something has, the smarter it sounds automatically. <laughs> so I studied psychology in college. So if a girl asked me what I study, I would say psychological engineering <laughs> and then say with an emphasis on and then just make something up. <laughs> if you throw engineering in there or give it more syllables, it just sounds cooler. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, um, this, this is a, there, there's a lot to talk about in eschatology. It's a broad field of theology. <clears throat> and its implications are all over the place. That's the thing. When, when you study theology, you start realizing that one field of theology is connected to all the others. So, because it's the study of God, right? <laughs> yeah. Theologia. Yeah. Theologia. Theologia. Yeah. Theo or Theos. Or th- I don't know how you'd say it. What's the nominative? I haven't taken Greek yet. I don't even know what nominative means. It's a case. <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> my brother's name is case shout out to case uh, all right so sam uh let's get into it i'm gonna start off by talking to you about um the phenomenology of life and death in the old testament so let's start defining our terms right phenomenology we talked about this a bit so i'm gonna go ahead and oh no we did this in uh, another episode phenomenology is the study of experience bingo yeah so subjective experience right um, life and death, well, that's the what we're going to talk about. You know, what is life and what is death? And uh, I would argue that in modern times, we have a materialistic understanding of life and death that is not faithful to the ancient understanding. I was going to ask questions, but uh, I, I figure we're going to talk about that later. So Sure, yeah. Questions are always welcome, but if you want, we can... Uh... Yeah, we'll just wait. Okay, sounds good. So, first thing I'm going to talk to you about is... How did the ancient Hebrews understand life and death? Well, let's talk first and foremost about where does life come from? Like what causes the conception of life? Mm. So when a mommy and daddy love each other very much, <laughs> they call the stork. <laughs> the what? The stork. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, dude, are you serious? Yeah, what is it? It must be strictly American. Uh. Dude, I thought that was like super European. The stork? Yeah, the stork. You never heard that before? <clears throat> no. Yeah, so the, it's a it's a giant bird that delivers babies. Oh yeah, I know I know what that is. I didn't know it was called that. What do you call it? In fr- I'm assuming you just have so, a French I word that means like, stork. I think pelican. Uh, Le stork. <laughs> <laughs> you said pelican. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not. That is not the same thing as a stork. Okay. But uh, okay. that act, I mean, a pelican makes more sense. It has more baby carrying capability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the union between a man and a woman. So. The union, right, cap- capitalizing on that word, between a man and a woman is what produces the conception of life, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a manifestation of their relationship. Of their love, yeah. It's the, it's the fruit of their love, yeah. So <clears throat> communion and life are deeply ingrained in the Hebrew psyche. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, ingrained as connected. Well, it's- Can we talk about how I feel like that's different than the way modern culture views? Yeah, actually, I think we'll get into that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to get into that. Don't forget. But if you want a lot of thoughts, if you want to throw it out right now, we can get into it now. Honestly, Um, go ahead. Well, I don't want to ruin your flow. No, try it. Go ahead. (laughs) You're like, no, try it. Go ahead. Go ahead and try and ruin my flow. Yeah. (laughs) So I think I think it all comes from the. I think it all comes from the idea that uh, 
people don't see a difference between the dignity of a human being and the dignity of an animal. Interesting. Yeah. And so where if you, I mean, if you take a bunch of steps back, right? <laughs> Cause it's a bunch of steps ultimately, where does the dignity of a person come from as a Christian? How would you answer that? Um, from the fact that they're creating the image and likeness of God. Yeah, exactly. And an animal is not. Yeah. Right. So, so if we delete God from everything that you just said, it doesn't really work anymore. Right. Which gets into what do we mean by God? And the Hebrews think of God as life itself. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I this will, this is really? good. Yeah. This will all connect in a really cool way. Ooh, is that kind of how they tied it early? Like early theology would tie in like the Holy Spirit to. Um, yeah, the Holy Spirit is the life giving principle in God. So yeah, definitely. And the fact that it's the Holy Spirit through whom Mary is impregnated. We're getting really deep right now. Yeah, so let, let, let's let's backtrack. Right. Okay. We don't want to get too deep before we give out the, the fundamentals, right? <clears throat> so communion and life are intimately connected, right? Now, what gives life its its um its its youngness, its um its vibrant potential, its um its freshness, right? is uh the beginning of life right you start out really young full of potential fresh not old decrepit and sick right mm -hmm. so um when you become older you become more decrepit it's kind of a nasty word but you start to break apart right your life starts to leave you and the climax of that is death but what is death it's the absence of communion with the living right so what's connected with death is isolation the opposite of communion so on one side we have communion in life on the other we have death and isolation does that make sense yeah okay so this is where the concept the hebrew concept of sin comes in sin is the breaking of communion which is why sin leads to death which is why the corruptibility of the material world is connected to sin in St. Paul. That's a lot to chew on. Does that make sense, though? Say the last sentence one more time. So sin is the breaking of covenant communion. Mm -hmm. So sin is connected to death because death is the lack of communion, right? Yeah. That's why the corruptibility of this world is connected causally to sin in St. Paul. In fact, in Genesis. And by corruptibility, you mean the ability to die? Yes. So if you're a scientist, you might say, well, the second law of thermodynamics, right? But that's kind of missing the point. You see, the Hebrews aren't thinking scientifically. They're thinking phenomenologically. Mm -hmm. Communion brings about the blessing of life. Sin brings about the curse of death. Communion brings about the, the freshness of young life. And when you grow old, it's because of sin and you're being isolated more and more from the living. And that's death. So communion brings blessing, but unfaithfulness brings death. Right? Unf unfaithfulness to who? To others. So it is if, if a spouse is unfaithful, she brings upon herself or himself a curse. They've broken the covenant. Mm -hmm. And the penalty for that curse is death, which is why you have these harsh laws in the Torah about stoning people who are unfaithful. Unfortunately, it was women. But there's a there's a there's a fascinating progression in the story that um, culminates in the the ultimate um, dignification of woman with the capital W in the conception of Christ within one of one of the women's wombs, right? And she becomes uh, the representative of all of creation that enters into communion with the creator, right? So I don't want to get bogged down, but the idea here is that communion, life, and blessing are on one side in this phenomenology. Isolation 
or unfaithfulness, right? You see how that's connected? Being unfaithful is not being in communion. You're not being faithful to the communion, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and isolation is connected to sin and death. Or in other words, or I would say rather to curse and death. So communion, blessing, life, isolation, curse, death. I repeat, communion, blessing, life, isolation or sin, curse, and death. And in this context, is blessing just the opposite of curse? Yeah, so this is why in the Old Testament, when women are barren, it was considered a curse because they're not fertile to produce, not able to produce life. life and blessing. So that's why children are a blessing. So is this truth or is this just a way they understood the world? It's true. Like, think about it right now. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. But <clears throat> it also wouldn't like you it right now you wouldn't say that oh it's a curse for a woman to to be barren yeah to be barren well maybe a curse but curse implies that it's something they brought upon themselves yes no but that's the thing the hebrews didn't think that either uh i don't know but they, they kind of like they they made it seem that way no they thought it was possible that the woman brought upon herself a curse but it could also have been an ancestor it could okay. have, it could yeah. have been the unfaithfulness of so Israel. somebody brought it on. It's not just a factor of original sin. But it's like, if you look at the sophistication of the Old Testament, it's not always just somebody, although there is that in there. But that somebody uh, always represents what? That's actually very true. It represents yeah. sin, and what does sin represent? The lack of faithfulness of human nature, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, it is deeply true to this day. It's not wrong. But you have to understand it properly, sophisticatedly, if that's even a word, right? I'll allow it. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're covering our bases here to understand the rest of this concept, of these concepts within the realm of eschatology. Communion, interpersonal communion, right, is blessed by God. Blessing, another word for that would be favor. God favors that, but he doesn't favor unfaithfulness. He favors the good but not the lack thereof, right? Mm -hmm. So communion is blessed and the blessings are shown in the children, which are the life that stems from that faithfulness. Sin is when you're not faithful. It's separation. It's, it's isolation. And it brings about the curse of death. This is the phenomenology of life and death of the ancient Hebrews. And it's deeply true. And it gets into the the anthropological and cosmic understanding of the role of sin in creation itself creation is filled with death so sin and the death filledness of creation are intimately connected so does that make sense we have our our base here which the base is the concepts that we need to understand the rest that eventually develops so we're going to move into phase two. Do we have that down? Uh, you said the bait. So in my mind, I'm seeing the three parallels that you drew. So yes, communion, blessing, and life. Yes. Versus isolation, curse, and death. Yes. So that's the basis. Yes. And another word for isolation, which is key, and we should probably start using that instead of isolation, is sin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so sin... So I've never heard sin defined that way before. So right. I'm a little skeptical. Okay. Not skeptical, but like, I don't know. It's new. You want to play it out or do you want to move into phase two? Let's play it out. Okay, go ahead. So how would a normal person define sin? In my mind, it's just like a like missing the mark, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, and I saw this from Jordan Peterson, just like literally everything else. But it's well, like, missing the mark is true, and it, but you'll see the deeper you get into the concept of missing the mark, you end up with unfaithfulness. In, wrong worship in context of the covenant you mean no no like think of missing the mark is what's the what's the good mark goodness no so, so like, give, give me a concrete example of missing the mark what do you mean by that so if the mark is to be faithful and you are not faithful or you fall short of that fall short of faithfulness yeah then you're sinning yeah so your powers are directed at the wrong thing Right. Uh, so that's interesting there, right? Because we've had this conversation before where it's like actions are typically drawn by a 
sense of what is good, right? So I yeah. do something because I am interpreting that to be what is good at that time. Mm -hmm. So when I think of sin, and you're right, you're fixing my kind of like understanding of this. When I think of sin, I'm like, you're aiming, you're trying to do something and then you, you fall short. You're not. But you're right. When you when you sin, you're acting with full it's, like knowledge of. It's false worship. It's idolatry. You're, yeah, you're, 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 you're acting in the wrong direction, yeah. basically. But think Holy about cow. it. Yeah, Why, though? Good. Why, though? So it's not missing the mark. Just to like play this out real quick. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But it's not missing the mark. It's hitting the wrong target. Yeah, yeah. You're hitting the wrong target. But why are you hitting the wrong target? Because you think that there's some kind of good that's going to come from that. And I'm going to go a, deeper. A, yeah. No, why? I agree with you. Let's keep talking through it, but I agree with you. It's You're not – You're hit, how do I say this? You're hitting the wrong target because you're aiming at the wrong target because you're – you have a malaligned understanding of what is good. So you're right. You're you're looking at something and calling it good when it is not. There's it's internal idolatry. disorder. There's no – there's a harmony missing within your being. There's a fracture. Yeah, you're missing something. Within, so you're not in communion with yourself, right? Why is it with yourself? Because if I was in communion with myself – Right, my my emotions would would respond in alignment with reason, and and my will would act in alignment with reason. Sin, what it does is it brings about this this um, breakdown of harmony, where if you look at the Genesis account, God creates man and, and woman, right, and man and woman rule over the animals, and the animals are are there for men and women but in the account of the fall the animal tells the woman to tell the head oh, to follow her bro, to disobey god that's deep right so you have this in complete reversal of the harmony of things so communion is what makes harmony possible right so the lack of communion separation isolation sin is missing the mark missing the mark is the same thing as not being in harmony with yourself because you perceive the wrong things as good, not the right ones. Mm -hmm. Your emotions are not in line with your, with your intellect. So sin produces a separation between God and man, man in creation, and man with himself. So he's isolating himself. Yeah, he's he's he's. There's a disunity between his passions and his intellect. Mm -hmm. So that disunity is not a unity. It's not communion. So there's a, a lack of communion within his own being. So, and that gets into conscience, and that's a whole different topic we don't have time to get down, uh, to get into. So, we've got that down. Communion, blessing, life. Sin, curse, death. Now, moving on to phase two. You following? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. When there's a covenant made between God and Israel, right, there's two parties. God is faithful, and we'll get into how he's life itself, but God is faithful. Israel is not, right? So God promised blessings, which is connected to life and communion, to Israel. Yep. Israel was supposed to promise obedience in the sense of a communion of wills. My mm -hmm. will, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven means May our wills be in alignment with God's will, right? But when you disobey, you break that communion. And so what happens is you incur curse and death. And mm -hmm. so the Hebrews saw death as the consequences of man's ultimate lack of faithfulness in the Garden of Eden. So it's an anthropological commentary on man's relationship to God. That's why there's death in the world. That's why... It says in Genesis, you will surely die if you disobey me, if you yeah. eat of the tree, right? Well, so <clears throat> um, ancient Jews, though, had like a much more personal understanding of this, right? In, in the sense where it's like you're reaping the consequences of your actions. So in the Old Testament, there was a, it all hereditary kind of in the Old Testament. Oh, there's so, so much there. I want to try to uh, good questions. Yeah, yeah. So hit the wave tops if you can. Yeah, I'm legitimately curious. No, that's awesome. That's what we're here for. In the Old Testament, there's a progression when it comes to um, how is understood um, the blessings that a faithful man or woman 
incur versus the curses, and it has to do with whether they're obeying Torah or not. But then they start, it becomes more sophisticated. The good man is obeying Torah, but still is living a life that is riddled with curses that he doesn't deserve. And the unfaithful man is reaping riches and, and living sumptuously and reaping like seeming blessings. So there's this disconnect. What's going on? The phenomenology is exploring further how this doesn't make sense. Why is the good man being cursed and the bad man being blessed? That's a huge theme in the wisdom literature. Yeah. Um, but also this idea like, you know, is, we're not dying because our great, great grandfather did something wrong in that simplistic way. We're dying because we're participating in the sin of Adam. So we're descendants of Adam in a moral sense because we are, by the virtue of our lack of faithfulness, right? We are in solidarity with Adam, right? And so uh, original sin isn't just hereditary in the sense of it's concocted biologically. It's more of a uh, idea of natural solidarity by virtue of my status i've been born in a world that is not in communion with god and i add to that lack of communion through my sins and i'm in solidarity with adam because adam broke that communion and i was born in that broken communion mm. and so i i contribute to that broken communion and so i'm in in a sense in the loins of adam i'm contained in him in a moral sense and in solidarity and in virtue of my human nature, which is a fallen human nature in a world of, of where there's a lack of communion. So um, my point being is this, right? God is faithful. Israel is not. God promised blessing in life, but Israel incurred curse and death. Mm -hmm. So this creates a seeming complete incompatibility how can god be faithful in his promise of blessing in life if we broke the covenant and deserve curse and death there's a problem there yeah there has, there has to be some kind of rectification yes repair a rectification that must go through death mm. because the curse is there so the cur curse always incurs death yeah the, the, yes um it's the paradigmatic curse of breaking a covenant is death like ontologically this is the phenomenological perspective Can we talked this about this before pinky promise uh partly yeah a long time ago <laughs> you like break a pinky promise yeah. you lose your pinky <laughs> so you can do that you can do that exactly two times yep <laughs> that was one of our first episodes oh was it really I don't did even, that even get published i don't know yeah well it might be on youtube somewhere anyway in the depths <laughs> So the point being is that we have a dilemma. God made a promise of blessing in life, but we deserve, because of our unfaithfulness, curse and death. So how can God be faithful if we are unable to receive blessing in life? Well, the story, we know how it goes, but let's just... <laughs> let's just I saw the movie. <laughs> um, this is what the Pharisees developed so pharisaical theology right the theology of the pharisees they thought since god is faithful right what happens is this those in israel right who are faithful to the law to torah right and you, you start seeing this a lot especially in the book of maccabees right you see it a little bit in ezekiel and daniel but wave tops right and so what happens is that god will restore communion and therefore blessing and therefore life to those who are faithful to the terms of the covenant which is torah and so when they die the pharisees believed that israel corporately would come back to life because of god's faithfulness because god promised mm -hmm. and god doesn't break his promises and can, so can he break his promises no he cannot Ooh, i like that <laughs> i was gonna say that too but <laughs> that gets us into divine freedom but yeah. long story so um god <clears throat> made a promise we know he will not break it based on the faith of israel right and uh, anyway long story there and so those who are faithful still die 
Therefore, the logical consequence is that, well, God is faithful, but these people died, and God promised life, so the logical solution is what? A return to Resurrection, life. yeah. A return to life, exactly. And so the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, unlike the Sadducees, and they believed that the resurrection was going to be what inaugurates the new age. So now we enter, we've, we've been in our phase two. We're going to open up our phase two before getting to phase three. Phase two is this. In the theology of the Pharisees, they understood time as divided into two ages. The first age. The old age. Is the evil age. Ah, so close. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> the evil age is the age of sin and death. Mm -hmm. Right? It's from the fall to... Paul, Paul mentions that, doesn't he? Yes, in Galatians. Boom. And Paul was a? Oh, yeah, I guess a Pharisee. A Pharisee, yeah. yeah. Where do you think he's getting this stuff? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the first age is the evil age. The evil age is from the fall to the beginning of the new age. What's the new age? The new age is when God is vindicated and the faithful are restored to life. And Israel is corporately resurrected. And... The second age is basically the age of the new creation where Israel rules over the nations and it has been brought back to life. You see, you see how that works? Yeah. So that's the theology of the Pharisees. Do they have any description of like how that looks? Um, I mean, what do you mean by that? Like, is it like Valley of Dry Bones kind of thing or is it like... Well, uh, Valley of Dry Bones is in Ezekiel, right? And what happens in the Valley of Dry Bones? They come to life. Yeah. That's, that's the theology playing out. Yeah, but they're not like restored in any way, right? Yeah, so it's the beginning of the of the, of the the development of this understanding that the Pharisees end up having. Okay. So, yeah, because I'm like, that doesn't seem desirable at No, all. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we look <looking> like <laughs> the walking dead or something. Yeah, so Ezekiel starts pushing things forward. But I mean, it's not, it's not gloomy. It's like, it's like a hopeful what if, uh, but not just what if, but God spoke to me, you know, like he will be faithful. And, you know, those who died will come back in a certain sense. So it's beginning to develop in that direction. And then in Daniel, I think it's chapter 12. Um, there's also talk about that the sons of Israel will be as stars in the heavens. What does that mean? Uh, anyway, more on that. So a, a lot a lot of this, this is important. A lot of this I'm getting from N.T. Wright. But I, I'm going to take it a step further by bringing in Joseph Ratzinger, right? N.T. Wright is phenomenal, exceptional historian, uh, but Ratzinger, exceptional and phenomenal theologian with a very broad perspective that is historical, philosophical, um, you know, contemporary, ancient, you name it. He's, he's a brilliant theologian, probably the greatest of the 20th century. And so, <laughs> what? All right, that's funny. And so, re recapitalizing. Old age, age of sin and death. New age, age of new creation where Israel is alive and ruling over the nations. Right? And those who are faithful are brought back to life. Because God is faithful and he won't break his promises. Mm -hmm. Now, is that what happens? Well, no, it's not. And this is where we get to our phase three. Phase three is St. Paul's understanding, which started off pharisaical because he was a pharisee but gets modified by a moment in his life a, a very important one what moment do you think that is where he saw jesus yes on the road to damascus mm -hmm. fell off his donkey some you know in in caravaggio's painting it's a horse he fell off his ass onto his ass okay <laughs> <laughs> No, if I'm going to be Catholic, I can go. <laughs> yeah, so he he fell off, right? And and saw the risen Lord. Now, that's a category change. Why? Because the Pharisees believed that Israel would corporately be resurrected. But it wasn't corporate Israel. It was a single person, Jesus Christ. And that would also overlap the two ages right yeah we're getting oh there. you're smiling yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and it creates a a instead of a two-part 
um, story, it creates a three-part story. And this is the brilliance of the letters of St. Paul. It's completely new theology, but deeply rooted in the old. And it's something that is very difficult to explain if the resurrection is just this pious excitement movement that never happened. Mm -hmm. And so Paul's theology, which is extremely early, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he talks about the resurrection, is a utter and massive paradigm shift within Jewish theology that is impossible to explain unless Paul believed that a person was resurrected from the dead. And N.T. Wright gets into this but nobody, length. I mean, nobody disagrees that he believed somebody was resurrected from the dead, right? Uh, some or, people do disagree, yes. Some people think that he saw it as like a, a spiritual apotheosis where mm. Christ's spirit was divinized and stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, but so there's a lot there. That, again, wave tops, yep. unfortunately. Maybe we'll do some courses where we get really in depth and we could put those on my website. But point being is that it's no longer the evil age and then the new creation. It's now the evil age, the inauguration in Jesus Christ of the new creation and our temporal incorporation into it until the fulfillment of all things. That, at the fulfillment, is when the third age begins. So first age, evil age. Second age is the inaugurated third age. And the third age is the fulfillment of the third age. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when we're talking about the inauguration of, of what we're being incorporated into, and then it, it climaxes in a fulfillment, that word fulfillment is our topic, eschatology. The study of the fulfillment of all things. The word apocalypse doesn't just mean like the end of the world, right? A, a better translation would be revelation, right? A, apocalypsis means revelation. So it's not, when we think of apocalypse, we think the end of the world, the end of time. And so, in other words, revelation is the unveiling it's the beginning of the fulfillment of what everything was meant to be so eschatology is the study of that unveiling of that fulfillment of that arrival at the climax and end and reason and purpose of all things and what is it the lamb standing as slain and the heavenly city that we inhabit and also if you think of romans chapter 8 saint paul talks about us ruling over the nations as kings with the king of kings christ in a new creation that is spirit filled and not death filled spirit being the principle of life mm. and communion that's why the idea of a city is where men are in communion with each other men as in humanity right men and women <laughs> for those out there who get offended about that stuff <laughs> so so that's the third phase, which is St. Paul's eschatology. Now, do you want me to add a fourth phase or have I talked too long? <laughs> oh, spit that knowledge. Okay. You following? Or are you good? Yeah, feel good. Okay. So fourth phase, and then we'll get into something else in another episode. Fourth phase is basically life and death. If it's communion and isolation then it cannot merely be a material decay of the body. Death isn't merely the cessation of the physicality of man. Death is a matter of communion or not being in communion with God. So there's truth there, you know, that is death, right? Like physical death, being brain dead or heart dead, or I don't know. Those are conversations worth having. Right, because it, you know the whole idea of what can you do with organ transplantation and stuff like that. Interesting stuff, uh, worthwhile stuff, but not the point of what we're talking about. The point that we're talking about is death is much more than that for the ancients, for the Hebrews especially. Death is communion or lack of communion with God. And so Jesus says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he also says to us, 
He who eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life. So when we're grafted onto Christ in communion, we participate in the new life that he brings about. And so there's a sense in which we are living resurrection life now. And when Christ says you will have eternal life, he's not making a joke or a metaphor. He means it, which means that when we die, we don't. We right now are immortal because we're in communion with Christ. I knew it. I knew it. I've never even died once, bro. <laughs> and so the point that, that's really fascinating and that I'm trying to make is that by virtue of being in communion with Christ through his church and the sacraments, right, we are a resurrected people. Wait, so <clears throat> how can that be possible if we're still sinning or even capable of sin? Yeah, so that's why this new life is inaugurated in us, mm -hmm. but it hasn't reached its fullness. Now, there's a way that we can kill that life within us by being unfaithful to the covenant in a way that separates us from Christ, mm -hmm. right? But if we're faithful, but we're not perfect, right? So here we have the, the sin of death that John talks about, and then the other sin, which is uh, what we call vino in Catholic tradition venial versus mortal sin right and so there's a sense in which we don't have quite yet the fullness of that resurrected life right because because our bodies will be redeemed as well right not just um it, it's it's not just the spirit you might say but it, i'm i'm I, I don't really like dividing like that spirit and matter it's kind of um anachronistic but in a sense like we are living resurrected life not the fullness thereof quite yet because we're being slowly and temporally incorporated into it does that make sense that's why we can talk about the theological virtues or the life of the spirit living within us but slowly saint paul says the spirit is groaning within us mm -hmm. because we're dying to self and living the new resurrected life to jesus that's what the theology of baptism is. We enter into the death of Jesus and come out into his resurrected life. So we are living the resurrected life. We are immortal. But we're slowly and throughout time being more and more incorporated into it. And this brings us to justification and the debates between Catholics and Protestants. Can you increase in your justification? Well, justification is the life of Jesus in you. Yes, you can. Is it because of your works apart from the life given by God? No. Right? Yeah, because you can't separate those things. No. So, But it's your participation in that. Yeah, so that's a whole different can of worms we, we could do an entire episode on. I would actually really like to do that. So, yeah, so, so this was about eschatology. Let me recap everything. <laughs> You're like, let's not get wrapped around an entire completely different subject. So Exactly. That's fair. So first of all, do you want to maybe like spit back at me that knowledge and see if uh, learning has occurred or do you want me to recap everything or we can do both? Cap, cap. <laughs> okay, so you have communion, blessing, and life. Right? This is the, the original intention. And then by acting outside of that right sinning ultimately which is not necessarily missing the mark but aiming at the wrong mark because our there's a, a discontinuity in basically you said within yourself i'm not sure if i hammered that one down completely but the idea is what i have asserted as goodness in my mind is incorrect mm -hmm. and so i'm aiming at the wrong target yeah. So I miss that. That leads to curse, which leads to death. Yeah. So that is all very true. And that is a paradigm. So, so this thing is the truth is multifaceted. There's not different truths, right? We're not relativists. Yeah, totally agree but with that. But the truth is very deep, beautiful, and you can think and discover things about it like ad nauseum, like mm -hmm. for lifetimes, right? So the, you're coming at it from one perspective, which is absolutely true. 
and I'm coming at it from a different perspective, which is true as well. And both perspectives are in harmony, and I tried to kind of show you a little bit of, about that, but we didn't get too deep into it. So my perspective is more that sin is just lack of communion. It's okay. breaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I asked you a bunch of questions about that. And that's, <laughs> that's totally fine. So sin is is faithlessness, where you're not faithful, so you're not acting in accord with that intended communion. You're being isolated from what you're supposed to, the person you're supposed to love. You're cutting yourself off from them mm -hmm. and also from each other. So communion with God is crucial for communion with each other. Yep. But so anyway. And then basically, right? So in, in, in the context of that covenant, God is in an effort to maintain his end of the covenant. Is it still allowing us to, I don't want to say so, not allowing us, but he's allowing the, He's allowing the consequences of our separation from that covenant to be basically manifested, right? The justice still needs to be done, but it's Christ that's ultimately paying the price for that so that we can still reap the benefits of eternal life. Yes. And that gets us into another, but so, yeah, I just... Things fix, in my mind. Fix something. What did I say? Did I say something a little weird? No, no, no. It, it was accurate. It was good. It was true. <laughs> it, but it brings up other things that people like talk about, like penal substitution or Christus Victor. And all, and, but those are like, those are in the field of soteriology, which is the study of salvation and especially the, the atonement, the cross. But we're not going to get to that. So, yes, we're good. Okay. Keep going. Okay. And then the last part essentially was about. Um, was about the evil age versus the new age. And so the idea is that Christ being resurrected. No, that's the third part. Second part, evil age versus the new age is for what the Pharisees believed. Okay. Right? What we, yeah, what did we talk about there? That all of Israel that, that was faithful would be resurrected corporately, and then there would be the new age. Yeah. And it's just one and two. But Paul's like, wait a minute, Jesus, based on him, one, two, and three which is one evil age, two, resurrection in one person, three, our incorporation and the fulfillment of that. Okay. Sorry. I guess I, no, I didn't completely understand the, um, the implications of that. So the idea is two, resurrection of Christ, and then three is the corporate resurrection of everybody all at the same time? I think I, 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 I confused you. So I'm... It's not hard to do. Part one <laughs> is the phenomenology of life and death in the Hebrew scriptures. Part two is the theology of the Pharisees. Jesus is not in the picture. Part three is the theology of St. Paul when Jesus comes into the picture and changes everything. So the theology of the Pharisees sees the evil age and then the new age where God vindicates his covenant by raising all of Israel. That's not what happens though. Oh, I see what you mean by one, two, and three. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. you're right. I was confused. There, there's but... one, two, and three of our phases in the episode, and then there's one, two, and three of the third phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what so, you're saying. Sorry yeah, about there that. There was a lot there. I yeah. need a flow chart. <laughs> cool. All right. I think that's a good recap. Uh, it might be a little confusing for the for the audience. I confused myself there for a second. <laughs> It'd be like that sometimes, yeah. as the kids say. So, Sam, thanks for talking about eschatology with me. Uh, we'll do some more episodes because it's a very vast topic and the implications are numerous, especially when it comes to heaven, hell, purgatory, you know, death, the soul, so much stuff, right? Anyway, so Sam? What does this have to do with that new Disney movie? Just kidding. <laughs> what? Soul. That was a new Disney movie. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a Pixar movie. Eh, I, same thing now anyway, huh? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. So I'll close this out. I think you should uh, hit that like button. Probably subscribe. We're on all major platforms, including YouTube. Although we don't have video yet, working on that. Stand by. If you'd like to help us work on that, Patreon. www.patreon.com slash the logos project. Appreciate you guys. See you.